All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. I am really excited for today's event. It's, everything is coming together for today's event. We have an amazing location. We have an amazing speaker. We're talking about a really important topic uh, in climate change. And as I look uh, at our numbers here, uh, tuning in via YouTube, we have hundreds of classrooms who are tuning in live with us. So I want to give a big shout out uh, to all of those classrooms across Canada uh, and in the US. I can see lots of comments in the chat bar. Keep them coming in, introduce yourself, let us know where you're tuning in from. But after that, save that chat bar uh, for questions. We wanna make sure that we can find all of your questions and we don't wanna have to mute anybody today. So uh, looking forward to seeing your questions in the chat bar. Uh, all right, let's get things going. So in 2019, 2020, uh, Sunova Sorby and Hilda Strom made history when they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. They spent 12 months at the remote trapper's cabin called Bum Sabu, located at 78 degrees north and 140 kilometers from the closest town of Long Yerbian in Svalbard. Climate change is not taking a break, so neither are they. They returned to Svalbard in November and uh, have been overwintering at Bum Sabu. They'll be there till May uh, of this year. Along with them, they brought a team of 10 global partners to make Hearts in the Ice the bridge between science and global citizens to better understand climate change and why we all need to play our role. They will continue to serve as citizen scientists on a variety of projects from observing clouds and the auroras to flying drones to monitor ice, collecting phytoplankton samples uh, and ice cores as they build on their second year of data collection. All right, it is time to bring the ladies in. I have Hilden Sunova joining us live via satellite phone. Hilden Sunova, how are we doing today? All right, <laughs> we're gonna have to put a little pause on that. They are joining live via satellite phone. Uh, there's no internet connectivity up there. Uh, there is no telephone lines. Uh, we are doing this via satellite. So occasionally they drop out and they just have to call me back uh, on the phone. So we should have them back with us shortly. Their closest neighbors, no kidding, are the polar bears. Sometimes they're coming up right uh, to the cabin door. Uh, they have Etra, the third member of their team uh, with us, their dog, their polar bear alarm, their companion. Uh, so they are... Um, uh, well done there. So we're going to give them just a moment to see if they can come back and join us via satellite phone. If not, we'll take a little bit of a different tact. I'll bring uh, David in to join us a little bit earlier and we'll start the Q&A a little bit earlier while we wait to see if they can sort out uh, their satellite phone issues. But we had them with us right until I finished the intro. Then I heard the familiar static buzz uh, of the satellite call dropping. So uh, I do want to give a few more shout outs. And then if they're not back with us, we'll bring David in and we'll start uh, the event that way. So, oh my gosh, so many uh, shout outs here. Sudbury, uh, Toronto, uh, Calgary, Alberta, uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, British Columbia. So great to see so many classrooms with us. And I think, Hilda and Seneva, how are we doing? Hey, we're back. We're good. Yeah, we'll talk about that weather system here. All right. Well, I was just telling everybody that you're in a very remote location. Uh, technology is amazing, but satellite technology doesn't uh, always cooperate with us, does it? No, absolutely not. And we just had a heavy, heavy snowstorm just passing uh, for a few hours. But now the sun is shining, so let's cut fingers. All right, excellent. Well, Hilden Sunova, it is so great to have you joining us live from Arctic Svalbard. I've got your slides queued up. Uh, we're excited to catch up a little bit. Well, so are we, um, very much so. And um, Joe, if you can tee up slide 20, um, just we we want to say hi to all of you on the call today, both live and on YouTube. Hinda and I are really, really happy you could join us. I was born in this beautiful country that we're sitting in right now in Norway, um, and I was just a little one when my parents immigrated to Canada. So like many of you on the call, I grew up watching The Nature of Things with David Suzuki, and David, we are so over the moon honored that you're here with us today. Your work and the ways that you translate science and what we call the rather unexplainable in ways we can all understand is a really big gift, so thank you. All right. Our, um, 
our our topic. I just want to share a couple of things. Um, our topic this month is a big is a big one, eh, Joe? Climate change, and it's also a rather paralyzing and for some of us a rather depressing topic. So, our goal with Hearts in the Ice has always been to go for a, to go from what we call climate despair to climate optimism. But just by sharing our love for the natural spaces, as David has done with his programs, uh, that has so inspired us. And we especially want to focus on the polar regions that both he and I have been lucky enough to explore for, gosh, decades now. Can you still hear me okay? We got you loud and clear. Okay. Um, so we want to say a huge thank you to TELUS, um, of course, a Canadian company, for supporting our education outreach this month. We've had so many inspiring conversations with the TELUS team in Canada around their sustainability goals and our leadership, and they're really to be lauded. So thanks there. If you can switch over to slide number 10, just a whole bunch of um, science partners. And Hila and I are only as strong as our community, and that now includes all of you on this phone call. So there you go. We left, uh, as Joe mentioned, for Bumsabu, where we are right now, and it's hard to believe I'm even saying this, in September 2019, and we've been here for 17 months now. Yikes! Um, but we're just ordinary citizens, and we're, we've been able to bring uh, a host of international researchers together from so many different disciplines that you see up there on the screen right now. One studying the aurora, another air particles, another phytoplankton, 3D drone modeling, polar bear observations, and another using a four-foot uh, drill for ice cores. And another one, which isn't listed up there, wondering how in the world he and I are uh, coping and communicating and thriving in this isolation. They study NASA astronauts, and I think they're still trying to figure us out. So um, we just keep that one in the holding pattern. Uh, the last slide right now from me, and I'm going to pass you over to Hinda is um, what you're looking at here is a very large ice core. And what we're called is citizen scientists, and it's actually April is Citizen Science Month. So we want to encourage all of you on the, on the call to get out there in the natural world and pick a project and get curious. We have been very curious around changes happening uh, up here. And so we've been actively collecting data for all of those entities you saw on the previous slide. And the beauty of all of this for us is that they all are talking to each other and they're all leveraging off each other's data and findings. So it's very exciting for us to be a bridge between science and um, the average citizen and understanding what kind of changes. And so here we're drilling for an ice core for UNIS, the University Center of Svalbard. The longest ice core last year was 82 centimeters. This year it was 30 centimeters. And if you were sitting in the cabin with us right now looking out the window, you would see no ice in the, in the fjord, in the bay outside right now. So lots of changes uh, in all sorts of things, which we'll share a little bit later. But now I'm going to pass you over to Hilde. Hi, everyone. And hi, Joe. Maybe you can um, show the number six. You're still there, Joe? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Wow, that's good. So... There, you can see where. Oh, we may have just lost. Say again? Okay, we lost you for a second, but I think you're back. Okay, I'm back. Perfect. So you see the hut uh, way out in the wilderness, and you see our neighbors, that is reindeers, and we have polar bears around our hut. And um, we are on an island close to the North Pole. Actually, I think we are uh, the closest uh, people um, to the North Pole just now. And um, we are 140 kilometers from Longyearbyen. So we are stuck here out in the wilderness uh, together in this beautiful, beautiful world of nature and wildlife. Um, you, can, you can show them the next one, number seven. So you have, uh, we have been here now for two winters and we, you see the hut in the Northern Light, Aurora, and we are, um, taking pictures for and time lapse for, uh, NASA and it has been absolutely beautiful. But these two winters have been very different from each other. As soon as I said, we had, uh, an 82 centimeter, uh, ice core last year. 
So we had five months of uh, ice, sea ice last year, and this year we had barely one month. So it's it's really changing, and um, we have seen this. I've been living up on Svalbard for 25 years, and I've seen these changes for uh, such a long time, maybe 10 years now. And um, Svalbard is the place on Earth that uh, the temperature rise more than twice as fast as the rest of the world. So we are sort of a, a mirror to the climate change happening in the world. So, and the, the last one, number 18, uh, Joel, the wildlife up here is so vulnerable. The reindeer, as you see in the picture, has been really struggling this winter because early this winter we had a lot of rain instead of snow coming down. As per the, the reindeers are eating. Rain. The whole area where they eat are under a layer of ice, and so so this has really been a bad winter for the reindeers and also for the polar bears that are uh, dependent on the sea ice in order to eat. And we have now recently, both last winter and this winter, seen a lot of um, polar bears trying to survive from killing reindeers. But these changes are happening so fast. So it's really difficult or maybe even impossible for the reindeers to adapt to this really change in, in climate, this warmer temperature and, and less snow. And actually we're... Okay, it looks like we lost the connection, but I think... Um... Uh, Hilda was just wrapping up with that last slide there. So I'm going to bring uh, David in, introduce David uh, into the program while we wait for Hilda and Cinema to reconnect with us. So uh, our guest doesn't really need an introduction, especially here across Canada. Uh, Dr. David Suzuki is a scientist, broadcaster, author, and co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. He's the champion to the Order of Canada and a recipient of UNESCO's Kalinga uh, Prize for Science. Um, also the United Nations Environment Program Medal, among many other awards. He's familiar to television audiences across Canada as the host of CBC Science and Natural History television series, The Nature of Things. Speaking of the David Suzuki Foundation, the goal is to collaborate with Canadians from all walks of life, including government and business to conserve our environment and find solutions that will create a sustainable Canada through science-based research, education, and policy work. So I am gonna bring David in live with us now. Hey, David, how you doing? I'm good, thanks. Oops. Phone ringing? Yeah. <laughs> All right, that happens. You're a popular guy. <laughs> you left out one important uh, uh, category to describe me, and that is a father and grandfather. The absolutely. most important uh, job I have right now. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. And I believe you are joining us from your cabin today. So it's probably in a beautiful location. I am. I am. And uh, here's what I'm looking out at from my oh, window. Wow. And I'm with three of my grandchildren and um, they're waiting for me. Uh, once I'm off here, we'll be going out and gathering some oysters to eat and uh, playing, I guess. All right. Amazing. Well, it sounds like you've got an incredible day ahead of you. Thank you for spending a little bit of it with us. And David, I'd love to start with just, uh, you know, a, a question about what you've seen in, in, in your in your area in British Columbia, where you've lived for so long. How are you seeing the climate changing? Well, I think the, uh, the big warning came, uh, oh, a decade ago, when the northern forest suddenly turned bright red. I was flying uh, up north of Prince Rupert, and I was just shocked to see suddenly the forest was bright red as far as you could see. And the reason was that the pine trees were dying, and they were dying because of a parasite, uh, the mountain pine beetle, that is, you know, smaller than your, your little fingernail. Uh, these animals are, they're natural, they, they drill into pine trees, um, they occur all for thousands of years, but they're controlled by temperature. And as the temperatures have warmed, we don't have a prolonged period of five or six days of uh, 20 or 30 below zero. And uh, they've exploded and basically decimated the, uh, the northern uh, uh, 
the, uh, the, the, the pine trees and they're have blown over the Rocky Mountains now and they're into Alberta and they're going to go right across the, uh, the, the north uh, through the boreal forest. So that was a warning that big changes are happening. I did my first program on the nature of things on, we called it global warming back in 1988. In 1989, we broadcast the, uh, the program and, and in it I wrote, global warming is a threat to human beings, to our survival. It's a slow motion catastrophe. And I really thought it was going to hit maybe 60 or 70 years away. So I was much more interested in working on uh, forestry issues, you know, too many forests being cut down. I was worried about pollution in the oceans and overfishing. I was worried about uh, pollution in our lakes and rivers. I thought we could worry about global warming uh, years later. I can't believe the speed with which the changes have occurred. And, uh, you know, the problem we have is the evidence is overwhelming that we are warming the, the planet. But for most people who live in the city, we're really not paying much attention to what's going on as uh, the two ladies are seeing by being up there now, living where they have to pay attention to the temperature and, and to the rainfall and all of these other things. They can see the changes that are going on. But in a city, we don't really uh, um, pay much attention to it. So these changes that are small and yet over time are immense are taking place all around us. Uh, British Columbia, we're seeing the seas beginning to rise. And that means that when there are storms, we have more damage to our, our cities that live that are built uh, on the uh, ocean uh, on the ocean shores. But for me, as someone who loves the oceans, the changes in the uh, wild organisms in the, in the oceans are quite striking. We had three years ago, the starfish died off in a massive way. And uh, of course, we're seeing uh, invasive species like the humbled squid, which is a very vicious squid that eats salmon. Uh, we're seeing salmon populations drop. The orca are, are uh, dying out. All kinds of changes are happening in British Columbia. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's, that's kind of really puts the issue into perspective. You're talking about one part of the world, but these changes are happening all over the planet. So if you're seeing a lot in one section of the world, um, you know, we, we really are impacting the planet in in massive ways. We we lost Hilda and Sonova, their connection, but you know, they've been there for two winters and we'll get them to comment on that when they rejoin us. And they've seen two very different winters, a very cold winter last year, um, and then a much more milder, much more rain this year, uh, which has a huge effect uh, on the ecosystems and the animals found within there. In fact, Hilda and Sonova, I think we have you back now. All right. Well, David just shared with us some of the impacts that he has been seeing uh, in British Columbia uh, due to climate change. And I was wondering if you wanted to share a little bit about, you know, you were there two winters and you had two very different winters. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know what you heard. The last uh, thing I said was about that, that uh, last winter was a cold and, and good Arctic winter. And we had a lot of sea ice and it was snow, no rain. And this year, the temperature is really high, so much higher. And we've had uh, no sea ice, well, we had for barely a month. Um, and it gained 30 centimeters. But, I mean, it, it has really changed. And we see, I mean, we had maybe 20 reindeers around our hut. At every, every day, we had, could see uh, reindeers around our hut. And uh, now we, we barely see them because they climb up in, in, high up in the mountains and try to figure out how to eat. And they scrape in the in the in the, uh, in the rocks to try to chew out whatever they can find, and the and the polar bears are really struggling too because of the sea ice, and they eat primarily uh, seals. And now they have tried to uh, we we see them eat kelp. We gather their um, polar bear poop, and it's a lot of kelp in it. And we also see that they try to kill, and they do kill reindeer, but it's not enough. Um, 
uh, energy. Uh, they assume has a lot more fat. So it, it's really a struggle. And also the dense have been very much thinner. Over mom has been colder actually because the, the snow isolates her from the cold outside, insulates her um, from the from the cold outside. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a huge difference. So yeah. I just want to add to um, those phenomenal changes Hilda just described. We were on a snowmobile ride uh, two days ago to Hesha Fuel. It's um it's uh, one of the fjords right next to us, and we came upon what looked like a little slaughterhouse. Uh, there were four reindeer uh, that had been killed and hunted and killed by a polar bear, uh, maybe one or two. But it's a real sign of um, pretty dramatic resilience, but also adaptation possibly for the species. The problem is that everything happens so fast. So the problem is for the polar bears to actually adapt to these uh, rapidly changes. Yeah. Yeah, amazing yeah. The, the changes yeah. you've seen in just over two winters. I wonder, Hill and Sunova, if you have a question you'd like to ask David. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, this is a, a question we've been asking the, the scientists before we left because one of the key things with um, from our perspective as citizens is that it's really difficult to get people to change behavior. And um, David, I, I just want to, we'd like to ask you, um, you know, given your years of, of studying, um, you know, climate change through science and, and having conversations with people and seeing the rate of estimate change. Oh. <laughs> I think we might have a question. Oh, too bad. All right. Well, I'm, just check Hilton. Yeah, we lost him. Okay, I'm going to. Get and, I think she. I think she was hinting about what. What can we do to really uh, raise public awareness about the not only that climate change is occurring, but how urgent uh, the need for uh, a change in our behavior is. Changing human behavior is probably the biggest challenge that we face, and I think you know as I look back over our evolutionary history. You know, for most of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We followed, we carried everything we owned on our backs, and we followed animals and plants through the seasons and, and through the migrations. We were born as a species in Africa. That was our birthplace. And we've lived, you know, uh, of course, we began to move after about 50,000 years. We started to move out into uh, new places. But basically, we knew we depended on nature for our survival. And so we saw that our well-being depended on our web of relationships with other animals, with other with plants, with the air, the water, the soil, the sun. People have always understood that. And they always understood that we have to act properly to, to keep it all going. We had responsibilities. But now, I think over the last thousand years, we've begun to think, well, we're special. We're so smart that really we are outside of nature. You know, we create our own habitats. We build our own houses and cities and we can uh, build technology to do our work and our vehicles travel faster than the speed of sound. We can escape gravity and live in outer space or travel down to the depths of the oceans. We're so special. Everything is about us. We're the most important. And, you know, even environmentalists say, well, we have to be a little more careful. Yeah, we have to be more careful, but we have to reinsert ourselves back into the web of life and realize that, Yes, we can take from nature, but we've got a responsibility. Everything we do has consequences. We have to be sure that we uh, allow Mother Nature to flourish. And I think that's the challenge, is to change our relationship with the Earth. We say that for 99% of human existence, we lived in an ecocentric world. That is, we saw we were a part of nature. Now we've taken over the planet. And, uh, you know, we begrudgingly say, oh, well, we'll have to save 10% of the land for, for other species. 
That means we take over 90% of the land. We're one species. We think we can take it all over. We've got to reinsert ourselves back into uh, an ecocentric way of living. And the great thing is today in Canada, you can't open a meeting without first acknowledging that this is a land of First Nations people. And they cared for the land for thousands of years. And I think there's the big change in our behavior has to come from recognizing that indigenous people have that ecocentric way of seeing the world. You know, their struggle for the land to get sovereignty over the land isn't so they can make more money. Their struggle for the land is so that they can help to take care of it. They see the land being destroyed by, by us, and they want to control that land so we can interact with the web in a different way. So we have much that we can learn from Indigenous people about where we fit in the world. And I think that's a very exciting uh, change that has happened in the last 10 or 15 years is our recognition that Indigenous people have something we need to, to learn about. You're muted. There we go. Yeah, absolutely, David. One thing I've noticed is a lot more scientists are paying attention to uh, Indigenous knowledge and bringing it into some of the projects that they're working on, some of their research, um, and bringing more guides out into the field with them. Um, and, and it just enhances the science so much. All of that traditional knowledge has been overlooked for so long. Um, so I think that's a great movement, and I'm excited to see that happening more in science, more of that recognition. Uh, David, I wonder, one more question before we meet some classrooms. I wonder, you know, a lot of students out there are tuning in, and I think a lot of times it, it can seem overwhelming. I'm just one person. If I stop using plastic bottles or, or something like that, you know, what impact does that have? I wonder what you'd say to a student who might feel that way or think, uh, you know, one small action maybe isn't a lot. It, it isn't a lot. Uh, my answer to that is each of us is a drop in the bucket. But if you have enough drops, you can fill any bucket there is. The problem now is, and I, I see young people really desperate to, to do something. Everybody's looking for a magic bullet. They say, uh, is there one thing? What's the one thing? There is no one thing. It's, it's, it's an accumulation of many, many things. But there's just no, no question that a child... Greta Thunberg from Sweden, one child, has had a huge impact, more than all of the other environmentalist people like me put together. Greta has had an enormous impact. Why? Because her message was very, very simple. You know, environmentalists are, uh, the government says, oh, you environmentalists, yeah, 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 the Minister of the Environment will take care of you. Uh, uh, you know, you're a special interest group. What Greta said is, our teachers have taught us to take science seriously. We read what scientists are saying. And what they're saying is, I don't have a future because you are destroying it, you adults. And that message has resonated so powerfully because nobody can say, oh, she just wants to become famous. Oh, she just wants to make more, more money. Or What she's saying is, as a child, I have no vested interest in the status quo. My future is at risk. And when I met her, I thanked her for all she's done. But I said, I am so sorry. This isn't what children should be doing. Children should be learning about the world, finding out the things that they're excited about or that they're good at, uh, meeting new people and making new friends. That's what children should be doing. Mom and dad should be fighting for your future. They're the ones that should be equal warriors on your behalf. And they should be telling the people that we elect to office, we want you to worry more than just about getting reelected. We want you to realize you're making decisions now that are affecting my child's future just because my children don't vote or because future generations aren't even here doesn't mean that you can ignore them. Their very future is at risk. So I urge young people, it's tragic that all of that momentum, I remind you that in 2019, 
You know, we had that buildup of millions of children around the world were marching behind Greta and saying, yes, our future is at risk. And then as if to punctuate what the children were saying, Australia ignited and burst into flame. And then the whole West Coast of North America started the uh, fires up and down the coast. That 2020 was supposed to be the year of fundamental change. And then the COVID-19 hit and everything's been put on hold. But I think, you know, I, I just heard a report this morning that children in British Columbia are starting a campaign to stop uh, single-use plastic. And uh, again, you know, it's one small thing. But children are still involved. And what I'm urging them to do before we come out of the this pandemic is we can't go tr trying to get back to the way things were before the COVID uh, lockdown. That was not normal and we can't continue on. So children should urge mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, all the people who love their the children and care for their future, they have got to get involved politically and demand that the people we elect to office put the children's future as the highest priority and make climate change and species extinction the highest uh, demand um, for change uh, in the coming years. This is very urgent. What the children are saying is true. They listen to the science and they know that we are in a dire situation. And the two women who are up in the Arctic right now are telling us the changes are apparent. And in only two years, they see enormous changes. You know, the thickness of the ice, that's terrifying to see the, that the thickness has been cut in half because, you know, the fresh water that's locked in ice, when it thaws out, it, it floats on top of the colder water, the, uh, salty water down below. And by flooding out, it affects the ocean currents that transfer warmth and cold to different parts of the world. So we're, by the changes going on in the north, and the north is warming at twice the, the rate that it is warming uh, further south. Uh, we are really pulling apart the great uh, heat systems, the great heat engines, uh, the winds, the atmosphere that, uh, that share the temperatures around the planet. So we've got to take this very, very seriously and elect the right people to office to do the big things. All right. Ab absolutely, David, no question. And, you know, I hope the students take that message to heart that, um, you know, they have a voice, they can make themselves heard. Uh, and they can make a difference because it really is uh, their futures that we're talking about. Well, David, I think we've got Hilden Sonova back on the satellite phone. We've got tons of classrooms. I think we should bring some in and start taking some of their questions uh, and see what they're thinking about today. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go to Lake Country, British Columbia. We've got some grade four or fives hanging out with Mrs. McKenzie. I'm going to bring them in with us right now. Hey, grade fours. Hello. All right, great to see you. Who's got a question for us? Um, if like, do you think making electric cars is making a big impact? Of course, electric cars will have a, a, a tremendous impact. And, uh, you know, you only have to look to Norway where over half of the cars <laughs> sold last year were electric cars. And uh, cars, transportation is a big uh, generator of greenhouse gases. And it's, uh, I've forgotten whether it's Ford or General Motors that has said uh, after a certain time, after a few years, the only cars they will be putting out will be electric cars. But, you know, I think that this is an opportunity to ask, why do we all need our own cars? You know, maybe there are better ways to, to move around. Uh, uh, if you're like me, my car just sits uh, parked somewhere 95% uh, of the time. Why do we need our own cars? I think the big changes that are going to happen uh, are how we move around uh, from place to place. You know, I, when I uh, uh, go by our local uh, elementary school, 
what do I see? I see huge lineups of cars with mom and dad dropping their kids off at school. What? What's going on here? We used to, kids used to walk. Uh, they used to take buses. We've got to uh, move ourselves in a different way. Electric cars, I believe, of course they're necessary, but the long run is we are just consuming too much and we have to find ways of living in a lighter way on the planet. And guess what? Walking or taking your bike is good for you. And why do you have to be driven uh, to school by parents or when you get to high school? Why do you have to have a car to drive to high school? I mean, what's going on here? Uh, electric cars are just a small part of the beginning. All right. Excellent. And I think, you know, you can fit in better design cities where it is easier to walk uh, to different places with that in mind. Yep. All right. Let's bring in another classroom. I'm going to bring in Mr. Hill. He's representing his grade eight uh, classroom virtually. Uh, Mr. Hill's group is hanging out with us in Ontario. How are we doing today? Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having us. Um, hi, David. I have hi. a class of grade eight students and they would love to know um, how do students living in an urban or a suburban environment, how do they reconnect to nature? Well, I think we have to realize uh, some very simple facts. I said this to the CEO of a, an oil company who wanted to negotiate with me. Uh, and I said, look, what is the most important thing every human being needs? And instead of giving the, the answer that your grade eight class, he would know right away, he went, well, uh, and, and I'm, I realize he's thinking money, a job. I said, Mr. CEO, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So isn't it a simple fact? Where does that air come from? That air doesn't belong to British Columbia or Vancouver. It doesn't belong to Alberta. What happens in each place? goes all over the, the, the planet. And, uh, you know, it was not an accident that when the fire broke out in Chernobyl uh, in uh, the Ukraine, it was Swedish scientists in, scientists in Sweden who announced to the world, there's been an accident in Ukraine and radioactivity is spreading around the earth. Air doesn't stay within national borders. And, you know, there are people now who say, I think it's my right not to not to wear a mask. Well, guess what? What comes out of your nose goes straight up my nose. So don't you think you have a responsibility? I think uh, that it's there are really simple things to realize. We may think, oh, in a city, nature isn't part of us, but it's in you. It's the air you breathe. And where does the air come from? And how is, you know, if there weren't plants in the world, you and I wouldn't be here. It was plants that created the oxygen-rich uh, atmosphere that we live in. If there are no plants, oxygen reacts very quickly and rusts things, uh, oxidizes things and disappears. It's plants in the oceans and on land that are constantly generating oxygen so that we, whether you live in a city or out in the country, that's a part of who we are. We're breathing it in. And it's the same with water. You know, you can tell your class that we're 70 to 80 percent water. We're basically a big blob of water with enough thickener added so we don't dribble away in the floor. But, you know, water comes out of my skin and my eyes and our mouth, and we have to drink water. If you don't have water for four to six days, you die. If you have to drink polluted water, you're sick. So clean water is, again, the gift. And water, you learn about the, the hydrologic cycle. Water covers 70% of the planet. It evaporates forms clouds, rains on land. Water is constantly flowing around the earth. And when it lands on the, so on the earth, the soil microorganisms, the plant roots, the tree roots filter that water so that we can drink it. So when you ask a child, when you turn on the tap, where does the water come from? Well, guess what? It's nature. You know, in Vancouver, we get our water from three old growth watersheds. The, the dams are surrounded by old growth rainforest. We don't have to do a thing to that water. It rains in, the trees filter it, and then we can drink it. So nature, even in a city, is a part of who you are. I love to 
talk to children in Toronto, I say, you know, ch kids, when you flush the toilet, do you know where it goes? They don't know. So I say, well, it goes out and it's uh, it's filtered and, and ultimately sits where bacteria and microorganisms digest it. And then it's uh, released into Lake Ontario. And then I said, when you turn your tap on, do you know where your water comes from? They don't know. Well, guess what? It comes from Lake Ontario. Then they go, what? You mean the water that I'm flushing down the toilet is coming up? So then you begin to realize nature is what cleanses that water in, a, in the whole cycle of movement. So I think uh, uh, that it's very easy, even in a city, you know, all of the food that you eat was once living. We eat plants and animals to create our own bodies. And then you think, where does the energy in my body, you know, I get the energy by uh, eating uh, carbohydrates and uh, sugars and uh, yeah, but where does that come from? Guess what? All of the plants in the world capture sunlight and with the sun, they create chemical, they store that chemical energy. And then we get that by eating plants or eating the animals that eat the plants. And we store that chemical energy that came from the sun in our bodies. So we, when we want to go out and play or work or move, uh, run around, uh, grow, all of that energy is sunlight that is captured by the rest of life on the planet that we get. So even in a big city, we are deeply embedded in and dependent on nature for the most critical things. All right. Uh, spectacular answer, David. And uh, you know, I really like your description of us as over 70% water with a, a little bit of thickener to keep us from dribbling away. I like that. I might have to use that in the future. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, we're going to bring another classroom in here. We've got Strathcona Elementary joining us. Um, let's see, where are they joining us from? This must be our group. I think it's our group in Chilliwack. So I'm going to let them turn their mic on and we'd love to grab a question. Can you guys unmute for us, Strathcona? There we go. Hi. 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 All right. Who's got a question? Speak up. We can't hear you. Yeah, I don't think the little microphone's working. There. How does the gas from our cars pollute the air in our like that we breathe well gas gasoline is a very complex mixture you know it all comes from life uh, millions and millions of years ago the carcasses of plants mainly uh, but also the animals as they died and and uh, decomposed in the soil gradually the oils and fats and various molecules accumulated over millions and millions of years so that coal oil and gas all represent the carcasses of those plants from way back. And uh, they, they represent the products of photosynthesis, the storage of energy from the sun in what we call fossil fuel. So in gasoline, which is a part of the gas that uh, uh, the oil industry gets, that is concentrated energy. And then in an engine, we burn it. You know, there are a few spark plugs that spark it and, and burn, and start, start a fire and burn that gas. But, and that releases the energy that's in that uh, mixture. But it isn't all burned up. And the products of the burning, carbon dioxide, water, some other compounds, nitrogen-rich compounds, are released as a byproduct of burning it. You know, when you take a piece of wood and burn it, it doesn't completely disappear as energy. You get the ash and the, the leftovers. That's the material that is, is uh, uh, le uh, produced from the burning of that wood. Well, in gasoline, most of it is, is uh, gaseous. They're small molecules like carbon dioxide. And of course, carbon dioxide uh, is part of what we call the greenhouse gases that traps heat uh, on the planet. All right, great question from our group at Strathcona Elementary. Thanks for joining us uh, live today. Let's head over now to Miss Little's group. They're joining us in Dutton, Ontario, some grade seven and eight students. 
How are we doing, seven eights? We're great. Do you want to say hi? Hello. <laughs> um, so a couple students are wondering, uh, what inspired you to start investigating and getting into environmental science and global warming and climate change? Was it a specific event or was it just out of your own curiosity? Well, no. I mean, I uh, grew up during uh, World War II because although my mother and father were born and raised in Canada, as uh, so was I and my sisters, because we were Japanese, we were considered a, a threat to the country. And so we were pulled out of Vancouver and put into camps in the mountains. And uh, we were in an, a very, very isolated area that today is Valhalla Provincial Park. And I spent as much, I, there was no school for the first year and a half because I didn't have teachers. And I was seven at the time. And I used to just wander through uh, the forest. And um, that really was a time when I bonded uh, with nature. And so nature is, you know, I've l always loved camping and hiking and fishing. And that's been a part of, of who I am. So it was only natural that uh, when the environmental movement started, I would see, oh, yes, you know, that's an important uh, uh, thing to talk about. But in terms of the climate uh, change, uh, I first went to Australia in 1988. And at that time, the Australian government had just established the Commission for the Future. This was a body that was to look at what was around, you know, in terms of the future for Australia and tell government, advise government. And when I went there, they showed me all of the evidence about climate change. Now, I knew about global warming, but for the first time, they showed me the the latest evidence, and I went, oh, my God, this is really serious. We've got to do something. And so uh, I came back from that, and then the following year, we did the first program for the nature of things on global warming. But as I said ev uh, earlier, even back then, I uh, back then I thought, it's a slow motion catastrophe. I never realized how fast the changes uh, would take place. You know, you think we've warmed the planet by 1.1 degree Celsius above pre-industrial level. That seems like a tiny change. I mean, you can go from nighttime to daytime and the change would be 20 degrees. Uh, how can 1.1 degree make such a big difference? Well, the reality is life evolved not on the basis of day, daily fluctuations in temperature, but the overall temperatures of the, uh, the planet. And uh, even a tiny change of half a degree over time can have an enormous impact on the rest of life. We're already seeing it with 1.1 degree. So... Uh, um, it was not, there wasn't a magic moment when I suddenly went, oh, global warming. But um, I guess in a way, uh, my Australian visit was uh, an important, an important step. All right. Uh, Hilda and Sonva, let me check in. We still have you? Yeah, we're here. All right. I would, I would love to have you piggyback on this question and hear what inspired the two of you uh, to, to do what you're doing over wintering two years in Svalbard. Well, this is Cinnabon, and I'll start with the first part because Tina has a whole another story. Um, oddly enough, uh, you know, neither one of us consider ourselves activists. Um, we've always been really keen observers and very curious and and have the privilege of um, hanging around really smart people. Um, for myself, it was in the Antarctic um, with, where I've, you know, spent a, a close to 25 years and over time, you just sort of, it, you know, you get it. You understand that um, what what happens in the Antarctic doesn't stay there. And the more you travel, uh, which is a privilege for all of us, and, and we have not moved from here for 17 months. So we like David's recommendation to um, get on the bike or walk more. Um, but we, you know, we've uh, experienced so much change and, for myself, it was a matter of, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Um, happy birthday, belated birthday to David, by the way, uh, just last week. Um, 
you know, we we really wanted to stand up for what we what we care about. We wanted to protect what we love. Um, as that saying goes, uh, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. And we felt like there was no more important time in our lives to actually dedicate um, the next part of our lives to connecting the dots and helping people understand that this is a really big deal. And I'm going to pass you to Hilda. Yeah, no, I can just echo all that. And for me, I've been living up in in Salva for 25 years. I've been connected to this uh, nature, the wildlife, uh, and the changes. But uh, back in 2015, we had a huge avalanche uh, taking uh, took uh, 12 of my neighbor houses uh, inside the settlement. Um, it was a lot of snow coming in, so that was the first time I the, the power of nature that I really so much love saw how devastating it is when things are out of control. And for me, I have, ever since I was a child almost, longed for an overwintering here in the Arctic, long before I came here. So this is a dream coming true, and for us, being able to um, try to inspire people to be one of those drops that David talks about in the bucket, and to be thoughtful users, and to understand the power they have as one single person that is um, a great opportunity for us to try to inspire all of you guys on the call. Yeah. And David, I want to share my screen here just for a moment. Uh, there, I don't know if you saw this picture, but there's some happy birthday wishes from Hilda and Sunima oh. and Etra. Uh, yeah. and so uh, I wanted to make sure that I shared that today. Very cool picture. Very nice. You know, uh, I have to say that we can't afford to be able to say I'm not an activist. Everybody has to be an activist now because this is urgent. We just don't have time to fool around. And I think of you two way up in the Arctic uh, as uh, astronauts. You know, you're now in a very confined area and you're able to see the world in a radically different way. Astronauts gave us the first vision of Earth you know, from outer space. And suddenly we realize, oh my goodness, uh, it's a single system. Look at look at that single system and how fragile because it's so thin the atmosphere is. Now you're looking at a very important part of the planet that most people have never visited, will never visit, and uh, that is responding most rapidly to the changes that are going on. So you are our, our pioneers up there giving us uh, a, a different take on the urgency to uh, to act. So I really thank the two of you. You're not, um, you know, amateurs now. You are activists up there uh, doing a great service uh, to us. And, um, you know, if I may uh, just say, uh, we are now in a situation that is like when I was in my last year in college in the United States, October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union shocked the world by launching a satellite, Sputnik. And at that time in 1957, the Soviet Union seemed really very powerful. They were making inroads, taking over countries in Africa, in Southeast Asia and South America. And then suddenly, they showed that technologically they were very advanced by launching Sputnik. And every hour and a half, that satellite went around and it was beep, beep, beeping, beeping over the United States. It was like saying, ha, 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 look at us, we're up here. And the Americans then tried to launch satellites and every one of the American rockets blew up. And meanwhile, the, the Russians launched the first animal, a dog, Laika, the first man, Yuri Gagarin, the first team of cosmonauts, the first spacewalk, the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. What did the Americans do? They didn't say, oh, my God, they're too far advanced. We can't do anything. Uh, it'll cost too much. They just started to pour money into developing science and technology. And then in 1962, President Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. In other words, he said, we're going to beat you Russians to the moon in 10 years. When he started that, uh, took up that challenge, the Americans had no idea how they were going to do it. 
But he said, we're going to get to the moon in 10 years. And look at what happened. They're the only country to land humans on the moon and bring them back. And every year, 60 years later, with Nobel Prizes in Science are announced, guess who still gets a huge number of them? They're American scientists or scientists working in America. Because 60 years ago, America said, we got to catch up to these guys and poured the money and support in. And every year, NASA, the National Association of Space, the National Aerosol, Aeronautics and Space Association, NASA publishes a magazine called Spinoff that shows all of these technologies and businesses that resulted from the space program that they didn't know at the time Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. You know, 24-hour uh, news channels from satellites, cell phones, laptop computers, GPS, ear thermometers, space blankets, hundreds of things that came out of the space program just because President Kennedy said, we choose to go to the moon. And that's what we need now is for all governments to say, we choose to stop climate change. That's our commitment. And I guarantee there will be all kinds of innovations and companies will start. This isn't going to be a destroyer of the economy. This is going to help the economy for developing all kinds of uh, new, new ideas and, and innovations. The most important thing is for our governments to say climate change is the most important challenge and we've got to beat it. All right. Uh, excellent point. I mean, when we get behind something, when we get motivated and excited, amazing things happen. And this getting behind this, looking for green solutions could be just like that space race and just create amazing technology uh, that will only benefit uh, us. So I'm going to bring in Madame Fairweather in Victoria, British Columbia. How are we doing today, everyone? All right, there they are. Can you grab your mic for me? Yeah. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, we have lots of questions, um, but uh, I think that a few of them were answered. Let me just find one that was, there you go. Okay, so how much more time, if we continue the way we're going now, uh, do you think we have until it's too late to make those changes? And a part of that question also is how do we maintain that uh, climate optimism that I think it was son of a who had mentioned? Well, I don't know about climate optimism. I think we only all we have left is hope. Uh, but, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change really gave us, uh, it seems to me, the time frame that we have to act. In 19, uh, sorry, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a special report. Normally, they publish their reports every five years, but they published a special report saying our studies show that if temperature rises above one and a half degrees, above the level that it was before uh, major industry, if it rises by more than one and a half degrees, then we simply can't anticipate the chaos that's going to result. And whether or not we're going to be able to keep up and adapt to the change is very, very questionable. So we have to aim at keeping temperature below one and a half degrees. When you do that, it tells you immediately how much more carbon we can add before we reach that level of 1.5 degrees. So they said we have to reduce our uh, emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from fossil fuels, by 45% uh, by 2030. So that's when your class, uh, you, you may be just starting university, we have to get there by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So that's a very big challenge. It means that basically we have to get off fossil fuels by 50% by 2030, that's in nine years, and 100% by 2050. Well, the report came out in 2018. We've already used over two years of that time to 2030, and our emissions are still going up. 
You know, I, we can't just keep letting it go up and, and hope that suddenly it's going to fall down at the last minute. We've already lost over two years of a 12-year period to reduce our energy by 50, uh, 50%. So that's a, uh, it's a big challenge. Uh, that's the timetable. Now, our government came back from the uh, big meetings in Madrid in 2019 and said, net zero carbon by 2050. And everybody's jumping on that and saying, yeah, we're aiming to have no more carbon added to the atmosphere by 2050. Well, that sounds wonderful, except, hmm, I wonder how many elections there will be between now and 2050. I reckon six, seven, or eight. And each time a new government comes in, they act as if, oh, well, what the previous government did, that's all junk. We're not going to do that. And they go off in a different direction. So what kind of a commitment is something that far away? You know, how many politicians in Ottawa today will still be in Parliament by 2050? Zero. Zero. None of them. So who can we throw in jail or who can we blame or fine for not meeting a target that was set in 2021? Nobody. So there's no accountability. A promise, oh, we'll be 100% net zero by 2050, is a political promise. We have never met a political promise to reduce our emissions in over 20 years. So uh, we've got to get on these politicians and tell them to quit fooling around. We are running out of time. All right, David, we have one more classroom to visit. Miss Baxter's uh, grade seven and eights in Guelph, Ontario. How are we doing, Mrs. Baxter? Hi, I'm good, thank you, how are you? Good. Good, so we have a question from Joseph um, in grade eight from St. Francis. Could we use geoengineering to slow down climate change if we had the opportunity? Well, I'm absolutely sure this is the way we're going to go. Because of the power of the fossil fuel industry. By the way, the fossil fuel industry we know has known that climate change created by fossil fuel burning is real in the early 1960s. The president of the American Petroleum Institute, which is their overall arching organization for all the fossil fuel companies, said in a speech in 20, uh, sorry, 1965, burning coal, oil, and gas is creating a problem. It's warming the planet. And by to the year 2000, if we don't do something, it will be out of human control. They've known about it. Exxon has known about it since the 1960s. So think about that. Every time you hear them say, oh, well, you know, we'll lose too many jobs and all that. Baloney, you guys haven't been serious. You've just been trying to make money and you've put the children's future at risk for that. Now, uh, I've forgotten what your question was. I, want, I got into that rant. What was the question, Joe? Uh, geoengineering, do you oh, think yeah. that's a potential? So what we're doing in order for the fossil fuel companies to keep making money, making profit, we're pushing the, the time that we can act to a narrower and narrower window. And what's happening now is what I predicted. We think we're so smart that we're gonna be able to invent a technology that will save our lives. Yes, we know that when volcanoes go off and spew a lot of these chemicals into the atmosphere, that that will cool the planet for a short period of time. So one of the ideas is spray some aerosols, you know, having jets flying 24 hours a day, uh, day after day after day, spraying aerosols of uh, sulfur compounds that will reflect the light. Or a more radical idea is send up uh, umbrellas, sheets that will cover a massive area and actually shield the earth so that it will reduce the amount of sunlight that hits the earth. Or the other thing that uh, people are big on is uh, they say, oh, well, Norway is already doing this. Uh, the oil industry itself would take carbon dioxide. When an oil well is running dry, that is, there's nothing more coming out. If they pump carbon dioxide under pressure into that oil well, 
it forces more oil to come out. And so oil companies have been using injection of carbon dioxide <coughs> into old oil wells to get more oil. But the carbon dioxide doesn't come back out. So they say, oh, that's great. We'll just take the carbon, pump it back into the earth, and it'll stay down there. Well, first of all, it all takes energy. You don't capture all the carbon that's generated by burning that fossil fuel, but you're going to try to capture the carbon you generate and pump it into the ground. What happens to it under the ground? We don't really know. It must be going into the, 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 the earth deep underground. It used to be thought that life, all life stopped at bedrock, below bedrock, there was nothing down there. But oil companies and, and other uh, drilling companies kept finding deep, deep down, they would get bacteria on their bits. And for a long time, they said, oh, that's contamination. But then scientists began to look at those bacteria and it was like, wow, these are, we've never seen bacteria. Right? We now know that, uh, that there is life down at least seven kilometers deep underground. There are, these are bacteria. These bacteria are so different from anything we know on the surface that we have to invent whole new categories to classify them. They're, it's like discovering life on Mars. They are just completely different from anything that we know. Now, life on the surface of the planet is a very thin layer. You know, the trees, the whales, all of that. If you add all of the life on the surface, and then you realize that these bacteria go down seven kilometers, and if that goes all around the earth, seven kilometers, it turns out there's more weight of living material under the ground than there is up on top. What are they doing down there? We have no idea. So wait a minute now, what, uh, what are they involved in water movement, in energy movement? Like what role do they play? We don't know. But I, I met one of the experts on this in, at Princeton University. And I said, tell us, uh, they're going to pump millions and millions of tons of carbon dioxide into the ground. What will that do to these bacteria that you're uh, studying down there? He said, I don't know, but the methanogens will love it. What's a methanogen? They're bacteria that take carbon dioxide and they eat it and, and they create methane. Methane is 80 times more potent to greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So we're going to pump carbon dioxide deep underground and then methanogens will produce more and more methane. Well, what happens to it down there? Where does the, the, the stuff we put down go? We don't know. But one thing, it, it will be forming big bubbles under rock. Much of that rock is limestone. And limestone is uh, degraded by acid. Acid eats away limestone. When uh, carbon dioxide bubble is formed under limestone, water will be circulating through it. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water as carbonic acid. So <laughs> the, carb the carbon that's stored down there will etch away the limestone and eventually come back out. So we are so ignorant about anything under the ground that we think, oh, it's smart. We'll just pump it under pressure without any idea what the long-term consequences will be. We can't keep assuming we're so smart. You know, the person that discovered DDT kills insects won a Nobel Prize in 1948. We thought, oh, what a great idea. And, and then as farmers began to use DDT in massive amounts, we said, what's happening to the fish? What's happening to the birds? And then we discovered a thing called biomagnification, which you should all study in your classes, so I won't explain what it is. When CFCs began to be used, you know, in refrigerators and spray cans, then someone discovered way above the earth, CFCs, uh, ultraviolet light breaks chlorine off CFCs and chlorine scavenges ozone. What the heck is over and over again? We think we're so smart, but we don't know enough to anticipate the long-term consequences. You know, when the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan in 1945, scientists didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. They didn't know there were electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays. 
uh, or the possibility of nuclear winter. So over and over again, we think we're smart enough to solve uh, challenges that we meet, but we're not humble enough to acknowledge how ignorant we are. And so uh, geoengineering, I'm absolutely sure this is what uh, society is going to go for because we are not doing what has to be done, which is stop putting out greenhouse gases. That's obviously the solution. And the, the solution for what you do with that carbon dioxide is already here. They're called trees. But of course, the time frame is too short. Even if we reforest the planet, trees take time to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They do that. Of course they do. And we should be regreening the planet. But our problem is the window of opportunity to reduce the greenhouse gases is getting shorter and shorter. And so in our arrogance, we think, oh, we're smart enough. We'll engineer our way out of this. We're not smart enough. Excuse me, David, we live on an absolutely incredible planet. There's so much we still have to learn about it. Uh, and you're absolutely right. The, the solution is to look for the natural ways, um, to use last look for sustainable solutions. Um, it's just the way that we have to do things. Um, we, we can't look you're for right. the shortcut. This is, this is a thing called biomimicry. Nature has been on the planet for 4 billion years. Nature has had tried to solve all the same problems we have. Where do you get your food? How do you get from being eaten? What do you do when you're sick? How can I have children? These are, are problems every species has had. If we look to nature and said, hmm, how did you solve that problem? We'd have a much better, bigger chance of technologies that work without disrupting the way Earth, Earth, Earth works. The, our challenge today is the one thing nature needs to solve these problems is time. And we are not a patient animal and we've run out of time. Yeah. Hilda and Sinova, I'd like to give you a chance to jump in if you want to say maybe a final word. Thank David. Uh, it's just been a great event today. And, you know, we've really dug deep into a lot of the issues that we are facing as a species. Well, this has been absolutely incredible that we've had, uh, first off, a satellite connection to be able to listen to um, all of what you've shared, David. It's been so interesting and so inspiring. And, you know, we, um, we, when we use the word optimism up here, it's all about hope because there's no alternative. Uh, if we, if we, if we don't have hope, we have nothing. And so, um, it's incumbent upon every single one of us on this call to, you know, jump in with both feet and, use your passionate curiosity to understand that our world is so precious and to the point that David mentioned in the very beginning around all of the indigenous cultures, we have such a profound respect up here where we are in this remote location for the wisdom of the elders and, you know, all of the natural medicines and the, the language that has existed way before we came came to, to to be born, uh, he and I, and the wisdom they possessed and understanding that nature provides for all of us. And um, as as to David's point earlier, um, we're running out of time. So TikTok, um, you know, get on the clock. But, but there is one thing I think that really gives us hope, and that uh, is how we have seen that the world has responded to COVID. Um, I mean, the whole world has worked together, and uh, the, most of the people have followed the rules. And, I mean, when our um, leaders really understand that there is a pressure uh, or a really a, a disaster going on, they really know how to handle it. So that gives us hope that they finally understand that climate change is the, the one most important thing that's happening just now. So um, I think that we are able to act, and all of us on the call are a part of that. Yeah. Joe, yeah. we would like to really say thank you to David. Um, I don't know if your camera can see us, but we actually are trying to log in with StreamYard. Uh, 
David, we we hope that uh, we can have dinner with you when we come to Vancouver. Uh, <laughs> not to be too forward, but why not? Um, we'll be there this summer, and we'd really love to have a sit down with you. And this has been such an honor um, for us. And again, we want to thank Telus for hosting the educational part of this. So, and Joe, you are a rock star as always. Well, I want to start out just by thanking our classrooms. What an incredible group. Hundreds of classrooms joining us from across Canada and the U.S. today. Thank you for your amazing questions. Obviously, a huge shout out to Hilda and Sunova uh, in Svalbard. We always love these connections. And David, thank you so much for being with us today, for sharing uh, some of what you've seen. Uh, and you know that we, we, we do need to be thinking more about this. Um, and we're going to let you go now to get with your grandkids. I know you're... Got some oyster collecting uh, to do. So thank you. Thank so you, much. and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, uh, to a meal. I'd be delighted to uh, to share that anytime you come to Vancouver. I've had my shot, so uh, uh, I'll be happy to see you. And thank you, Joe, and and thank you for everyone that's uh, uh, tuned in. We can't. We all have to leave this, and we all have to be activists. It's your futures that are at stake. So please, please, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, aunts, uncles, they've got to they've got to be fighting for your future on your behalf. All right. Before we sign off today, let's just pop in a couple of the groups that are still with us. There they are. All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh Hilda and Sunova, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna sign off for today. <laughs>